its humble beginnings in 1995, New Hope Christian Fellowship is now one of the world's fastest growing churches with over 10,000 people attending over a weekend. There's a joy, there's a blessing, there's a richness in the word, uh, there's fellowship, there's friendship. My first impression was like, I like this church, you know, this is a church that I can call home. New Hope puts a special emphasis on community outreach and enrichment in an effort to make a difference. We want to help transform the community. But more than anything, with everything that we do, whether it's cleaning or painting, we want to be sure that we touch on a life or lives that are out there. New Hope is also known for its award-winning multimedia and arts presentations and cutting-edge technology. You have to talk to the people that are, that are coming. You have to talk to the people that are out there in the communities. How do you talk to them? How do you communicate with them? You have to speak their language. New Hope has made a, made a real effort to try to speak the language of the community. That's multimedia. My heart is always touched by the people as I look out over the church. I don't see a big building or I don't see lots of activities. I see individuals, people's hearts that have been changed and people's hearts that have been touched. Big people that are growing in Christ because God never ever told me to build a big church. He said build big people. As I look around, I see that God is doing exactly that. Well, it's a joy to be with you because I think what we're going to talk about was, is going to affect every single one of us because every single one of you I see as black belts in the kingdom of God. That's why you're here. You're here because you hold the DNA of tomorrow's church. You're here because you're the shapers of tomorrow's church because you see, if you think about it, you as leaders, tomorrow's church will become what you are today. You know why? Because you will teach what you know, but ultimately, we're going to reproduce what we are. Isn't that right? You will reproduce what you are. So if I want tomorrow's church to be filled with men and women who are leaders and devoted to Christ, then what, what must I be? If I want tomorrow's church leaders to have good marriages and healthy, balanced lives, what must mine be? Because we can teach all kinds of nice theories and concepts and we can add all kinds of great ideas to the fire. But I tell you, in the end, we're going to reproduce what we are. So the greatest thing you can do, and one of the reasons this session is here, is because we've got to make sure that our inside guts, all the way to the core, there's a genuine integrity because you're going to reproduce you. That's what tomorrow's church is going to be. And today we want to take a look at that. How are we going to do that? We've got to make sure that what we've got is into the fabric of our life and it's genuine. That's the legacy that you're going to leave, not from here. It's going to be from here. It's who you are. It's what, you, what bleeds out of your toes, not com what comes out of your mouth. You know, I was thinking about this event that took place in my life about two years ago and how it changed my life. And I thought, we've got to, get, we've got to gather some principles out of that. And I want to I want you to catch these principles that, because it's going to happen to every single one of us. And I just wish in this session I can just give each of you a pill in some way that will take all the storms away so that you'll avoid all the pitfalls of leadership. But I can't and I won't do that. Every single one of us will go through these walls with different measure of intensity on each. But every single one of us are going to go through those walls. And there's going to be great lessons that will be learned out of it. So I can't take that away, but I can encourage you to look for God's presence because he's going to be there to walk you through and you'll come through better and not bitter. Some time ago, you know, we're a homeless church, so we rent all kinds of places. And, and uh, some time ago, the, the school that we're in gave us about a two-month notice that we couldn't meet there one weekend. So we're scrambling. So we have to rent tents and we go out to a park 
And uh, we set up these huge tents, and we have three services, about 4,000 each, and, and, and we have to set up sound system and trusses, and so it's very spendy, just for the trusses and lights, $23,000 for the lights, twenty two for the trusses. So just that, so it's a huge expense. Now we're risking the weather, even though Hawaii is always beautiful. <laughs> there is some rain. And so I'm saying, Lord, we're going to have to have this service out in the park. God, you, m m if you do anything for me, just don't let it rain. Because if it rains, it ruins the speakers. We've got to tarp everything. And, and half of the people are out in the open. God, please. So we're praying all week long. That weekend service comes. We have a one Saturday night service, two Sunday, because it's at the park. And we have a changed uh, service schedule. And Saturday night, I'm praying, oh, God, don't let it rain. And the clouds are forming. And it starts to drizzle. Some of the dances have to be canceled because it's too slippery on the platform. It's in the open air. Oh, God. I said, God, that night I went home. I said, Lord, tomorrow's two services. Lord, man, if you've done anything for me, just do this one. Just don't let it rain. You know how much I've done for you and the kingdom. So, God, come on. You've got meet me halfway. Just meet me halfway. Just don't let it rain. Well, the next morning I get up and it's pouring. And I'm thinking, oh, no. And so I get in my car, and I'm just, I'm going to try this confession thing. You know, I believe it's not raining. I just believe. I confess. <laughs> Glory to God. And I'm driving, and I don't even turn my windshield wipers on for faith because it's not raining. I go there and it's pouring. People are huddled under umbrellas. Half of the amount of people are there. And, and the, the band starts up, you know, and I'm afraid because they're in the rain playing. And you can just see one of them, you know, smoke coming out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm saying, so, oh God. So I'm out there in the rain. I'm praying. I'm lifting my hands and I'm complaining. God, come on. You told me you would be true. <laughs> and then oh, and, and I'm crying. And people are looking at me thinking, Look at our pastor. He's just worshiping God. <laughs> and I was just steaming mad. And I was walking around saying, God, good night. I spent so many years, uh, just one morning, one morning, you could have done this. Just one, keep the rain away. God. And I was just upset. And just, I don't know if you've ever had God just part the clouds and speak to you. But the Lord spoke to me right there. And I've never forgotten. He said, Wayne, you're more concerned about the absence of rain then you are the presence of God. You've never asked me once for my presence to be in attendance today. You just want there to be no rain. And what if I took away the rain, but you never had my presence in your ministry? Would that make you happy? It exploded in my life. The shrapnel of that is still with me today. I, I would never want to take away the storms out of your life, but I do pray that through this, morning, this, this session today that you will catch some of the principles of God and put it into your life. I had been going for 22 years as a senior pastor. I was flying at Mach 4. And one of the things about being an entrepreneurial kind of person is that by default, everything you start, you're now the leader of it. You start a church, you're the pastor. You start a Bible college, you're the president. You start a church planning organization, you're the director. You start whatever, you are the, you're the cheese. And so by default, I'm running all of these different departments, and, and, and I was just frying. I didn't know what was happening. This load was coming upon me more and more and more. But, you know, in those days, you think you're invincible. You know, in those days, I could break both legs in the morning, and I'd, I'd heal by noon. I'd be playing basketball. Yeah, when you think you're invincible, like before, I could eat anything and not gain any weight. Now I just chew on an idea and I gain five pounds. <laughs> Isn't that right? So when everything is going full blast, all of a sudden, things in me start to slow down. And I don't catch this dichotomy until it's too late. There were some symptoms. There was some joy that was leaking. I mean, ministry wasn't fun anymore. It was a task. And people were not the reason for my ministry. People became a problem to be avoided. And I would start just kind of shying away from phone calls. And decisions that used to be easy now came hard. I used to be able to make them so quickly. But now I deliberated until I was polarized and then paralyzed. My creativity started to flag. And I would rather duplicate rather than incarnate. I'd find out what you're doing, just duplicate it. 
But I wasn't hearing God anymore for fresh manna, for fresh stuff. And the fear started to come in. And when people would bring a problem into my office, Wayne, we've got parking problems. Wayne, we got this. In my mind, they were saying, you're not doing enough. Work harder. And I began to avoid problems. And what I didn't know was that there was a meltdown that was starting on the inside. I started thinking about retiring. At that time, I was 52, and I was thinking, do I have enough money to retire? Can I just retire? Can I do something different? And it became, to, became something that almost overwhelmed my thinking. What I didn't know was on the inside, a meltdown had started. You know the problem? The problem is you, you're all high-capacity leaders here, and, and you, know, you catch a vision, but after a while... You, you can't get out of the vision. It's almost like the vision imprisons you. And I can't stop. I got all of these things, all of these things going, and I can't stop. And I was frying on the inside. And I didn't know it. Then the physical symptoms started. The physical symptoms began where I, I had a hard time breathing. And I thought it was asthma. And I went to the doctor and got these inhalers. And then I, my heart began to get a little erratic and my eyes started <laughs> twitching like, you know, Clouseau and the Pink Panther. And I, I, I couldn't stop it. And I thought, what is going on? But it all came to a head when I was speaking in a conference in California. I didn't know what was going on, but there was, there was a meltdown on the inside. But, you know, you just keep going because you can't stop. Everyone's expecting you to continue. To, you're strong, invincible. And I was out for a run, and I don't know where along the run, I, I can't even recall this in my memory, but I found myself sitting on the curb, and I just found myself crying. I was crying, and I couldn't stop my crying, and I was sobbing. And I looked at myself like this, and I thought, what in the world is going on? It was like I was looking at myself, thinking, what is happening to me? This can't be happening. And I began to weep and weep and weep. You see, I was empty on the inside. I was, I was a dead leader running. When I got back home, I sat with a doctor, a psychiatrist, and I said, what in the world is happening to me? And as I parlayed the scenario out to him, he said, you know, Wayne, you, your serotonin levels are completely depleted. And I said, Sarah who? Can you get her back on the job? He said, no, not, not, no, serotonin. It's like an endorphin. And if you continue to go and you don't replenish your system, you, what happens is you deplete it and then you substitute it with adrenaline. And when that happens, that which began your ministry, the fuel is not going to destroy it unless you switch it back. And you've been going on adrenaline as a substitute for your serotonin for far too long and you've got to recharge that serotonin level. You see, one of the problems we have, people, is that we don't forget that we're pastors. We forget that we're human. And he said, you've got to, you've got to charge that back up. And I said, well, how do I get that, that charge back up? I said, can you just hook me up? Give me a pill? He said, no, it, it, it doesn't, it, you don't charge this overnight. It's sort of like it trickle charges. It takes a while. You're going to need six months or more to just lay still and get some rest. I said, six months? No way. I'd go stir crazy. He said, no, you got to take. I said, I can maybe take six to eight weeks, but that's it. He said, you've got to do something because you're frying your circuits right now. And if you don't handle this season right, he said, you will never return to the original capacity or productivity that you had before. You see... Suffering will change you, but not always for the better. You have to choose that. See, 1 Peter 4.19 says this. It says, Let also those who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. Do you hear that? Let those who suffer according to the will of God. Did you know that there's a way to suffer that's according to the will of God? And there's a way that we can suffer that's not according to the will of God. One will destroy you. The other one will reform you and refashion you. And he was saying, if you don't handle this correctly, you will lose much of that capacity. 
And then he said something that, was, that just got me thinking. He said, Wayne, often the road to what you perceive as success, the road to success and the road to a nervous breakdown are sometimes the very same road. And I got to thinking about that. And so I said, well, what do I do? Because I want to I wanna make sure that, that I'm doing this right. I'm going through this time, but it's going to refashion me. And so over the next season, I would spend some time switching price tags around in my life. Because what I measured as valuable wasn't as valuable as this. And this needs to go here. And that needs to go there. It will be a time where I need to change all of the set points of my life. That which I thought was right. I have to reevaluate, and the very core of my being would have to be changed. And sometimes God does that. You see, he has, to, he has to do this. Sometimes the only way radical change happens is through radical pain. You say, well, why does God do that? You know, because we're too hard-headed. We don't listen. He says, it's like an airplane. Say you're flying at 32,000 feet and you're just cruising along. Everything is fine. But all of a sudden, there's engine failure and something sputters and you begin to take a nosedive towards terra firma. And you're pulling back on that wheel and you're praying, oh God, help me now. And this plane is going towards the earth. And just as you start to come towards the, the trees and it's just scraping the belly of your plane, you're just pulling back as hard as you can and the G-forces are pulling on you and you're holding back. God, you're yelling you know right then you become really open to God <laughs> isn't that right now the reason God pulls you down so close sometimes to death is because at that moment when you're on the gurney going in or you're at some physical breakdown or marital struggle or something is frying your heart is really open to God and you know what God does he takes that opportune moment and he begins to deposit in you lifelong lessons that you are receptive to and you wouldn't have been before that but you're in this state of being where he can now put into you deposit into you lifelong lessons that'll stay with you the rest of your life and you're open to and you're willing to make whatever change is necessary and then God begins to to charge your engines again you start to pull back up and when you do this is what God's gonna say to you now Wayne I'm gonna bring you back up to 32,000 feet you'll be alright but listen when I get you up there don't forget the lessons you learned when your belly was scraping the ground Do you understand that's why God has to do this I can't take that away from you and you don't want it to be taken away from you I was going through a time where I thought I was having a heart attack I went through every test there can be for my heart and went through cardio, uh, cardiac specialists and we did all these different tests. And in fact, I was driving down the road and my left arm started going numb and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't clear my lungs. I called the doctor. I said, I think I'm having a heart attack. And he said, well, does this happen? You're short of breath when you're sleeping? I said, no, just times like this. And he said, Wayne, you're having an anxiety attack. I said, for what? He said, I don't know. He said, but, but you're having an anxiety attack. And I knew I had to do something. So with this doctor, he said, you know, I can put you on medication to let you down because you've got to get your serotonin level up and your adrenaline down. And sometimes if you just take that adrenaline away and you don't do anything, it's like coming off of heroin. You're going to go through some withdrawals. I said, I, I just, I got to do it. I don't have the time a year to do it. So he said, then you better get some rest. So here's my story. So you know what I did? I actually checked myself into a monastery. It's one of those no-talking monasteries. <laughs> Honest. And I said, I'm just going to go for a week, and I need to just, I need to get my life together. So I went, and, and you know, this, these things, it's like no talking, no internet, no cell phone coverage, because it's way up in the boonies, and there's no coffee. <laughs> Yeah, it was like hell. <laughs> you think about that. It's like I go in to look for my cabin, you know, it's up in the woods, and they don't even talk to you. They have a little thing here. Your cabin is, and you have to, okay. And you just, and the cool thing is, though, these monks, they have hoods and everything. They, the only time they use their voice, which is beautiful, is in the morning, they sing the Psalms at 5 a.m., and then at Vespers at 6.30 in the evening. That's it. So that's the only time they use their voices. The first day was novel. 
I can handle it. But the second day, my, my whole system began to shut down. And I tell you, I, was, I couldn't sleep. I, I, I couldn't breathe. My neck started to go out because my, my muscles began to tense up. I was in a fetal position. It was the worst day of my life. I remember writing in my journey, I have, in my journal rather, I've, I've never had this amount of pain. And I struggled. The next day I would fill three yellow pads of paper of the things that I needed to change in my life. The pain was so great. I said, God, whatever you need me to change. I needed to change the parameters, the set points. I needed to have new navigational beacons in my life, new principles, new, new price tags. I'm going to switch them all. And I knew God was reforming me. I felt so, I was like Isaiah in Isaiah 6. Lord, woe is me for I am undone. It was like God had dismantled me and took me apart. But I knew he was doing something. I knew he was up to something. It's sort of like, you know, I took my motorcycle in because I wanted a, a little bit more juice in my engine. And so the first thing that the mechanic did, great mechanic, was he dismantled my engine. Just completely undid it. And it looked so pitiful there on his, his workbench. I looked at my beautiful motorcycle. But then, you know what he did? He bored out the cylinders. And he put in bigger, higher compression pistons in it. And when he put it back together, it looked basically the same. But the insides were completely different. And there was much more horsepower. And sometimes God's going to do that to you. You're going to feel undone. You're going to feel dismantled. And it can come at any state in your ministry. I was just with 22 of the top young leaders in Dallas, Texas. All guys under 40 years old now. And they, were all, they all had churches over 3,000. We brought them together, and, and I was one of kind of like the veteran grandpas there to kind of give them some, some help and advice. And you know what? The same symptoms I went through, I was, I was seeing and observing in these guys under 40. One guy was crying, and he said this, I don't want my kids growing up hating God because of me. And I thought, man, it's, it's starting quicker and quicker. Because, you know, as wonderful as these conferences are, you're going to learn great ideas. You're going to get great principles. But it's like adding nitric oxide to your fuel. And I'm seeing these symptoms earlier and earlier. Will, will you avoid them? You're still going to go through them. God's going to dismantle you. But, you know, I think God said, Wayne, I, I see what's coming up ahead, and I need you to have a little bit more horsepower. So he dismantled me during that time, and I just wrote that stuff out on, on the, this, these yellow pads of paper. All the things that I needed to change. And then I began to take a look at my own pride and how I had violated the Sabbath again and again and again because I thought I was invincible. And I made a covenant with God saying, Lord, as soon as I get out of here, I'm going to put these into practice. I'm going to put them into practice. Well, about the fifth day, I was starting to go stir crazy. I mean, no coffee, no internet, no cell phone, you know, and I was like, God, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got these pads, I'm going to go and take care of it, and, but I still had a couple more days in this program, you know, and the monks are walking around with their hoods, and you know you can't leave, but I had to get out of there, I had to get some coffee, <laughs> so... True story. So about the fourth day, fifth day, I couldn't handle it. So right after the morning prayers, five, five o'clock in the morning, it was still dark. So I took my car and I drove out of there with my lights off. <laughs> and I put my cell phone on my dash to see when it would get reception because there's no cell coverage. So I'm driving, looking at that thing, waiting for it to go beep, beep, you know, and it's waiting. An hour and a half driving. And then it finally went boop, boop. It was like, I, I, I came alive again. Yes. And so I pulled into the next town. There was an internet cafe. Do you know how happy that made me? I drank five, six cups of coffee. I did all the email I could. Even to people I don't know, I emailed. I was just starving. I went out and I, I called my assistant in Hawaii. I said, Ellen, this is Wayne. He said, why are you whispering? Shh. I said, I escaped. 
He said, you what? I said, shh. Yeah, I had to get out of there. I couldn't stand it anymore. He said, was it hard? I said, no, but getting back in will. <laughs> I, went, I went back into that cafe. I talked to, hello? Hi, my name is Wayne. Hi, how are you? Hello? Hi, how are you? Yeah, I was just, I was starving. But by about five o'clock, I had to go back into this place, man. I was just so afraid. I could just see him with their hoods on and just eyes glowing, you know? <laughs> You'd say, were they mad? And I don't know. They, they, never, they never said anything. <laughs> I don't care who you are. That's funny. But you know, after that, my life has changed. I have really made some set points, and I want to give you some principles that I hope you'll catch, and, and please write these down. One of the things the doctor said, Wayne, when you go on this little break, you got to do everything that just fills your tank. Would you write this down? The first is, is you got to know what fills and what drains your tank. You got to know that. It's sort of like this, and I'll draw some stuff on this board, but uh, it's sort of like you have an emotional tank here and you've got a drain and you've also got an input and if your your level sort of, of serotonin or your emotions are at, at a high level here and it's full because you've got some good input coming in wonderful you can do all kinds of stuff but if this drain becomes greater than your input you begin to decrease in this sort of level on the inside when it gets to this first mark here, it needs to be almost like alarms going off because what will happen is you'll have an anxiety attack and you'll feel it. Alarms should go off. If you don't start to fill, it'll drain down to the second where you'll have an emotional breakdown. And if you ignore it, and like me, just was a continued, uh, just a dead leader running, if you're not careful and gets down to here, this is where they say you have a nervous breakdown. But alarms should be going off at each level. And you need to know what fills your tank and what drains it. And you need to write that down. For me, sports, I ride a motorcycle. I, uh, I paddle out in the ocean. I love to read, do devotions, travel with my wife. Those are some of the things. You need to know what fills your tank. And, and during this time, I had to do only the things that filled my tank. There's some things that drain. Too much counseling for me drains me. When I've got unresolved problems at home, when I have staff that uh, have uh, unresolved problems and, and they just continue to go on like it's, they live on a level of mediocrity, it just bothers me. There are certain things that really fry me. These are uh, overtaxed schedule, uh, overbooking myself, inability to say no. These things drain me. Now, what happens is when you get too busy, now watch this. When you get too busy and the drain gets to in, be increased, what happens is when you say, oh, I'm just too busy, I can't play basketball anymore, something that filled your tank. I'm so busy in the ministry, I really can't take time to ride a motorcycle or I can't do paddling or I can't take the time to read or do this or that. Why? Because I'm too busy. Then when that happens, that's called suicide because if... If you've got an increased drain and you shut off your input, guess what's going to happen? Do you know when my schedule gets busier, you know what I do now? I increase my play. In fact, right now, I'm on a five-day motorcycle trip. I parked my bike in Billings and flew here to be with you. And when I get back, I'm getting back on, going through Yellowstone. You, the busier your schedule, the more taxing the more you increase your fill. But what's our, our proclivity? We usually cut off the fill because we got too much drain. Do you understand how nuts that is? We do that all the time. You write down what fills 
and what drains. And here's what I'd like to give you as an assignment. You then have your spouse do the same thing. Have her or him. You, you have them fill out what fills their tank. Just things, ask yourself these three questions when you say, what fills my tank? Ask yourself these three questions. First is this, what am I doing and with whom am I doing these things and where am I doing it? Where I, when I do these things, I feel most alive and I feel the fullest. Can you remember those three questions? What am I doing? With whom am I doing these things? And where am I doing these things? That when I do this, I feel most alive and I feel the fullest. That'll help you to think through what fills your tank. And you've got to know yourself in that way because when the times get tough, you're going to have to make sure because you can handle all kinds of drain if you've got a lot of fill coming in. But if you don't, you're in trouble. And as ministry gets more complicated, the drain increases. And that which used to fill your tank is not going to keep up with the drain. And so you've got to measure that. Then have your spouse do it. And you've got to know what fills her tank. And then this is what I'd suggest that you do. When you're done, you switch papers. You give your wife or your spouse yours. She, your spouse, gives uh, you um, hers. And then you use that as a prayer list over the next month. And you pray. I pray for my wife that, Lord, help me to be someone that helps her fill her tank in these ways and help me to alleviate some of these drains. Do you know what kind of friendship you'll start to develop if you'll do those two things? It'll help you immensely. Some time ago when we first moved to Hawaii, uh, we brought our kids, the grandkids left mom or grandmother in Oregon and, and uh, we moved to Hawaii. And what I didn't know was one of the things that really filled my wife Anna's tank was talking with her mom about the grandkids and all of these things. So she would call her about every two days and she'd spend an hour on the phone. Now, I'm just brand new in ministry and, and when the phone bill is a hundred and some dollars a month from her calling her mom, I just flew off the handle. I said, you can't do this anymore. You're going to take me to the poorhouse. I can't handle this. If you're, you want to talk to your mother from now on, you have her call you or you call her collect. I was a compassionate man. And, and, I said, and you can do that once a week. And you know, my wife is so sweet. She said, okay, and she complied. But you know what? After about two months, I noticed my wife was changing. She was becoming the wicked witch of the north. And I thought, what is happening to her? And what I didn't realize was her sharing her life with her mom as her best friend was something that really filled her tank. And me, not knowing what fills her tank, actually, I was cutting off stuff that she looked forward to. You think we become good friends then? And the things that drained her tank, I was demanding she do more of. Our marriage was getting really thin really fast. And then I understood this, and we made some changes. And I said, honey, I'm so sorry. You, you and your mom are best friends, and I have been so blind. You call your mom as often as you want to. And she didn't abuse it. But I tell you, 100 bucks a month, 150 a month is a small price tag to pay for a happy wife. <laughs> now let me tell you the kicker. She started calling her mom again and she just turned back into the beautiful lady that I married. And let, here's the kicker. About a year and a half, her mother died. And you think about it. What would my marriage be today if I had stuck to my stupid guns and her mom passed away? Do you understand what would be going on in our life? This is incredibly important. If you'll learn what fills and what drains your tank, it will save you years. It might save your ministry and your marriage as well. The second thing that I want you to catch as a principle is number two, would you write down, understand balance in life. Understand balance in life. Now, you know, so, so many people come to me and they say, Wayne, how do you, where does ministry end and family begin? I mean, because is this ministry and this family or is this family and this ministry, where, how do you balance all of this? 
And so we think, well, we, it's like, sort of like this balance beam. We just got to have ministry here, staff, you stay on this side, and f- family here on this side, and son and daughter. Okay, well, I've got it right here. It's right about here. All right. My life is balanced. Now, nobody move. <laughs> Isn't that right? But we all know that Life isn't static. Ministry isn't static. It's moving all the time because you're dealing with something that's organic and it's growing. And life and ministry eventuates. It's not organized. It grows. It's protracted. And the Holy Spirit will see something moving this way and you've got to be able to see the leading of the Spirit and move staff this way and cut staff over here. And then ministry is going to eventuate this way as he's growing your ministry and you as a leader have to be able to be in advance of what's going on to see close enough to the Spirit of God to see what's, what's happening, what's emerging so that you can move staff this way and cut over here. Otherwise... You'll just keep right on going. And someone said, you can take the Holy Spirit out of half of the U.S. churches and they'll keep right on going like nothing took place. But you see, leaders need to be led by the Spirit. And so watch this. You'll have a fulcrum, we call it, the center balance piece here. And let's just say that the fulcrum is your heart, your attention. And, and your life is here and you've got a fulcrum here balancing it. Now, you've got family here in ministry. Now, does one end and one begin? No, watch this. If you say this is family and this is ministry, you got it wrong in the beginning. Watch this. This is not family and this is not ministry. Watch this. This is all ministry. My family is my ministry. Can I encourage you, if you're a pastor, when you travel, take your son with you, take your daughter with you. At first, my board would say, "Why are you taking your son with you? It's kind of nepotism, isn't it? You're taking him and, and take some member of the church." I said, "My son is a member of the church." <laughs> yeah, 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 but, but, but you should take an elder. No, this time my wife is going. Yeah, but you should be an elder. Like this is ministry. I have ministry with my wife. Well, yeah, you see, because if an elder kind of goes bad and south, you know, I feel horrible, but we keep, going, keep on going. But if my wife and my kids go south, we don't keep going. We're done. We're done. So my family is my ministry. It's not family and ministry. It's ministry. I'm dedicated to what God is saying to me. So watch this. So there's going to be times, remember, this is the fulcrum. It's your heart. Now, there's going to be times where the Holy Spirit is going to see some storm clouds rising in your wife or your family or whatever, and he's going to put his finger on a part of your life like this, and you're going to sense an out-of-balanced feeling because there's something wrong in your marriage. Now, you can either ignore it or run from it, and if you run from it and you move that attention somewhere else, you're in big trouble. But watch this. If the Holy Spirit... How many of you know that the Holy Spirit knows what's going on next year in your life? Yeah. So... So he will say, there's something happening here, Wayne. And you know what you do to keep a balanced life? Watch this. If he puts weight on this side of my family, you know what I do? I just move my heart that way. And I move it closer to my family for a season. And you know what? This is still called balanced. And then he'll lift it up and he'll say, okay, your son is doing fine. Now I want you to work on your finances a little bit and you'll feel that pressure there. Here's what you do to keep a balanced life. Just move your fulcrum that way. Move your heart. You know what that's called? Following the leading of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> yeah. And then when everything calms down, you'll move it back over here. And the Lord might say, you need to concentrate on some staff issues. You move, just move your fulcrum that way. You see, that's a principle of the fulcrum. You need to understand that. There's some times... Now, I was raised in a family where my dad was a first sergeant. And, and whenever I rested, it meant that I was lazy. And so I felt guilty whenever I took a break. And even now when I take a break in ministry, I think, I'm lazy. But I have to realize in in the monastery, that was one of the things I wrote down. Why do I feel this way? And I had to go back to the very core of how I was raised. And the Holy Spirit began to show me these things. So I said, well, I I still feel guilty. Then the Lord said, ask for permission then to take a break. So you know what I do now? I actually go to my secretary, Mary, and I say, hey, Mary, 
I just feel the Lord saying spend some time with Anna today and so can I, can I come in like at 2 o'clock this afternoon? I'm just going to have lunch and, or a late breakfast with Anna and we're just going to take a walk. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah, I got everything taken care of. Oh, thank you. And you know what? I can go home guilt-free because I got permission. <laughs> I actually called my executive pastor once. I said, Elwin, can I take the day off? Because He said, hey, Wayne, you don't have to ask me for anything like that. You can do whatever you want to. And I said, Elwin, don't say that to me. No, you can't say that. Is it okay for me to take the day off? Do you have everything covered? Absolutely. Good. So I can have permission to take the day off? Yep. Good. Thank you so much. And then there's a guilt-free kind of break. I don't know if you were raised like me, but you almost got to trick your mind. <laughs> but that's what you have to do. You move your fulcrum that way. You know what? This is called a balanced life. And then the Lord may say, you've got to work on this, and you move it this way. And as you move your heart closer to what the Holy Spirit is doing, you have a life that's always moving, always in the ebb and flow of things, and you stay balanced. There's once the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, you need to spend time with your son. He was sixth grade. I went to his classroom, took him out of school. He said, Dad, what are you doing? He said, we're playing hooky. <laughs> he said, no way. What's the teacher going to say? I said, shh, come on. We went fishing till this day. He's 26 years old. You ask him, what's one of the most meaningful days? He'll say, well, my dad and I played hooky. <laughs> learn to live a balanced life. Understand balance. And then would you write number three? Then learn to lead out of rest. Lead out of rest. Here's something that I really had to change. You know, what I used to do is I would fill my calendar with appointments and all the things that I had to do. And then I'd look and say, now where can I take a break? Oh, oh man, oh, oh, I don't know if I've got time. I'll do it right here. So I would rush into this break, and while I'm in the break, I'm saying, oh, man, I got a stuff to do when I get back. Oh, and I could never take a break. I violated the Sabbath rest for years, and I fried my circuits. Why? Because I was sinning? No. You know what I find? People listen. You don't mess up because you're evil. We mess up a lot of times because we're frail. It's not because we're evil. Just because if someone said, Wayne, why did you have the, that? Why did you fry your engines? Because you were evil? No. Did you love the ministry? Guilty. Did you love to see lost people get saved? Guilty. Did you want things done well? Guilty. You see, it's not because we're evil. But we've got to have some parameters and new set points and navigational beacons. Otherwise, you'll go amiss. And that's why I want to have you catch these principles. Lead out of rest. You know what I do now? I don't wait for my calendar to fill up and then look for breaks. Here's what I do. This will help you immensely. I schedule in my rest points first before the calendar fills up. I say, I'm going to need a break around here. Oh, I'm going to see my daughter here. I'm going to visit so-and-so around here. And I'm going to do this and do a little writing over here. Okay, this is nice. All right, now go ahead, and then they fill in the rest. But they don't take these things. Oh, once in a while I might move it a little bit, but I've got to keep them in. That's a, a whole new set of parameters that I've never done before. And I cannot tell you how happy my wife is now because she knows that we're going to visit our daughter in this week, and we're going to go here and this, and we're going to take a break over there. She looks forward to it. She is so happy. My, my wife is great. And then I can say, call up a friend, hey, could you cover for me here in January? And Because I'm going to take a break. And I schedule in different teachers and speakers, and I lead out of rest. Did you know that, by the way, God created activity to be birthed out of rest? Think about it. When does your day begin? When you get up? Mm -mm. Read Genesis again. Twas morning and evening the first day? No. Was what? Was evening and morning the first day you know how God creates he starts with evening your day begins when not when you get up it begins when you go to sleep think about that your day begins when you sleep so if you go to sleep too late you get up tired and smashed you've really violated the way God created us to live was evening and morning. So you want to make sure that you're getting rest. Why? Because activity is birthed out of rest. Here's, by the way, if you need to sleep in sometime because rest is real important to keeping your balance correct, 
I tell people, if you need to sleep in, learn to sleep in on the front side of the clock, <laughs> not on the back side. <laughs> hey, this will this will be worth your whole summit fee. Listen to this. Your deepest REM sleep is between 11 o'clock and about 3 in the morning. That's when you go and you get your deepest amount of rest. So if you don't get to bed till 1, you've already missed your deepest amount of sleep. And you sleep in till 9 o'clock, you get 8 hours of sleep and you think, I slept in. No, you actually had a very shallow sleep. That's why when you get up at 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock, you're lethargic, you're listless, you're still tired. You can sleep in on the back side, bad. Or sleep in on the front side, smart. See, what you do is you go to bed at 8 o'clock and you can still get up at 5 and you've had 9 hours of sleep. I get up at 5 o'clock and people say, whoo, you're up early. No, oh, I slept in. <laughs> what? I slept in. And I feel so much better and I'm ready for the day and I'm healthier because you're beginning to learn to cooperate with the design of God. Twas evening and morning the first day. Learn to sleep in on the right side of the clock. It will help you immensely. And then you can sleep in. Otherwise, your soul is gone. You'll be a dead leader running. Story is told of a guy that was late on a safari. So he hires some people to carry his things, and he's three days late. So he jumps in, and these guys are running to catch up with the, the safari that he's late for. And the first day, they just fall exhausted at the campfire. The next morning, he blows his whistle. Come on, let's go. We can catch up with the safari. So they put their bags on their backs and start running. Second day, they fall in exhaustion. Next day, burp, if we hurry, we might catch them in two days. So they run the whole third day, and they fall exhausted. Fourth day, he gets up. Burp, come on, we can catch them today. And they just sit around the fire, tossing embers. Come on, let's go. And the leader says, we are not moving. He said, well, I, I, I paid you to help me catch up with the safari. He said, sir, we're not going to move all day. Why? He said, because you've been pushing us so hard the first three days that we have to wait one whole day to let our souls catch up with us. <laughs> you lead out of rest because then and only then can you put your heart into everything God's asked you to do. And you won't be a dead leader running. And then would you write down number four? Then find a lightning rod. What? Yeah, find a lightning rod. You know what that is? Here, you know, in the Midwest parts of the U.S., because they have lightning strikes, they put up this long rod that's actually grounded. So when electri the uh, electricity of a lightning strike hits it, it takes the hit and it grounds it. If not, it hits the building and fries all the wires and computers. So they have a lightning rod that grounds the electrical charge. In your life, you're going to be filled with electrical charge sometime from board meetings, from problems unresolved, from a uh, budget that's in the red, family situations. You're going to have this charge on the inside, and you're a walking strike. And sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. And if you haven't determined a lightning rod or someone that you can talk to and vomit on, and they just ground it, you're going to talk to anybody that's close. You'll bump into somebody, hey, you know, some people downstairs, the staff I hired, I hate them, I hate them. <laughs> and this guy over here, just a, an innocent staff person, is like, whoa, pastor is mad. <laughs> hey, Billy, pastor's stinking mad today, don't go near him. And Billy, whoa, yeah, oh, man. And pretty soon, they just talk to each other in the lunchroom, and now you've got all these fried staff, their hair sticking, their crispy critters, and you walk by and go, whoa, what is going on? You guys are burnt. <laughs> you walk by. You see, what happens is you don't realize that if you don't find a lightning rod, you're going to fry all kinds of people, your family included, because you're going to be dealing with problems that you can't resolve right away. So I have a couple of people that I make appointments with and I say, I just got to let loose some stuff. And they'll close the door and they'll say, fire away. And these are older guys that help me process these things. And if stuff come out of my mouth that shouldn't be mentioned anywhere else, they don't mention it. They just ground it. And sometimes I'll let a word fly and they'll go, oh. They'll say, you feel strongly about this, don't you? <laughs> 
No, they don't go. Whoa. Oh. That will help you so much. You need that. You need that. You need to be able to, to ch- let that charge go. Otherwise, you'll start frying people inadvertently. Now, by the way, someone say, well, what about your wife? You know, my wife is not one of my lightning rods. My wife loves me so much. She's a smart woman. Uh, she, uh, she just thinks I'm amazing. Wonderful lady. And, uh, but, but because she loves me so much, if I share something, she just fries. And, so, you know, it's like you're at a board meeting and you have a struggle with a board member and the board member's coming back at you and you're coming back at him and you go home and you say to your wife, man, Vern just, just fried me yet last night. I can't stand him. What in the world is he doing on the board? I think he's demon-possessed. I think so. <laughs> and your wife says, what happened? You share with her. And now she's holding this in. Well, let's say the next day Vern called you. Hey, Wayne, I'm so sorry last night. I was so out of place, out of place. Oh, Vern, hey, no problem. I forgive you. Okay. Yeah, let's have lunch. Great. Now, the only problem is you're fine with Vern, but you forget to tell your wife. So the next Sunday, she's by the door and Vern walks by. Isn't that right? And you say, honey, what's going on? I hate him. I hate him. (laughs) And you say, oh, hon, I forgot to tell you. We worked it all out. You what? Yeah, we worked it all out. He's fine. You did? Uh You didn't tell me? Uh -uh. (laughs) So you say, when do you share with your wife? I share with her from the victory side. When it's done, I say, honey, Vern and I had this knockdown drag out the other day. What? No, 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 no. Keep your claws in. Because he called and, and it's worked out. And I tell you, God taught me some great lessons. Really? Yeah. Oh, thanks. That's neat. Thanks for sharing that. You understand? Share with your spouse. But I do it from the victory side. Find a lightning rod. That will help you immensely. And then lastly, discipline your daily devotions. Folks, listen, if you miss everything else, please catch this. This is the most important thing we've ever done for our church, to teach them how to feed, have a self-feeding program. If you go to our website, we have one designed just for the summit called lifejournal.cc. We design it for everybody else too, but it's uh, it's for the summit as well. So go to lifejournal.cc, and uh, I I have a, a journal starter kit that will... The best thing we've done for our church, we have literally thousands of people doing daily devotions. We have a reading program that takes them through the Bible in a year. And and they do a very simple journaling exercise. You see, in Deuteronomy 17, it says that God required of the kings that they write and read the law daily. Some people say, well, well, I, uh, I read the Bible, but I don't journal. No, no, journal. Journal in a very simple way. Here's an acrostic. Say the word soap with me. Soap. Yeah, S-O-A-P. You, you just read the portion of Scripture that you need to read, that it tells you. And then you, you start with the soap acrostic. S stands for Scripture. You just write the Scripture out of the three chapters that you will have read. The Holy Spirit's going to highlight one for you. And he'll say, this is a promise for you. This is a promise that you can hold on to. It was during that monastery experience as I was continuing to read my devotions, I was ready to bail out. I wanted to bail out of the ministry and the Lord spoke to my heart out of Jeremiah. And it it says this, Jeremiah 17. It says, as for me, I will not hurry away from being a shepherd after you. And it was like God spoke to me. It was a prophetic word. Lord, thank you. If you're not doing a systematic kind of study through through the word, You will miss the prophetic voice of God and you'll make decisions and you'll make permanent decisions based on temporary setbacks. God's word will hold you up. S, scripture. You write the scripture. O stands for observation. Then you write an observation about it. A is an application. Then you write an application. How does it apply to me? And then P is prayer. You write out a prayer. And we have these journals 
just called a life journal. Looks like this. And in it is a place where after you do your, your daily entry, there's a place in the front and it's all set up for you that you can actually write the title of what God just spoke to you about, the page in the scripture. And I have a running catalog or a table of contents that goes along with it so that after three months or so, if I want to know what God has been speaking to me about, I, I look at this first page, the table of con contents, and in three minutes, uh, three seconds rather, I can find exactly what God spoke to me about in the page. I find it. And everything comes back to me because I write it in manuscript form. Be the best thing you can do. When you do a daily devotion, discipline yourself now. It will help you. And you write it out. Because there's only one book that God has promised to inspire. It's right here. Listen carefully. You won't have what it takes as far as wisdom. When you started this race, you won't have the wisdom necessary to finish it when you begin. You don't have the wisdom necessary to be the wife you want to be when you began as a wife. You won't have the wisdom necessary to be a pastor that you want to be when you began. You might have had the zeal, you might have had the call, but you won't have the wisdom. You've got to garner that along the way. And God will give you wisdom. It'll save you a lifetime. His promises and His instruction on a daily basis. And if you're not putting it in here, and if you're just giving it out there, this is called the art of preaching. I, I had a friend in California that he was preaching, and for the last year and a half that he was preaching, he was carrying on an affair with his secretary. And when it came to the surface, of course, he was summarily dismissed and disciplined. But I, having a relationship with him, called him and I said, what are you doing? How could you do that? And he said, oh, don't condemn me. I said, no, no. How can you live with that inconsistency where you're preaching the word of God but living so incongruently? How can you handle that? He said, you know, Wayne, what I was doing was I wasn't doing devotions. I was studying the Bible for sermons. So this is what I was doing, getting a sermon and giving it to the people. He said, what I should have been doing was this. Do you see the difference? Huge. And when you're people of daily devotions, it will begin to heal you from the inside and it will fill your tank so that you can carry out the assignment of God. There's many of you here that may be on the edge. You may be like me, just entering into that season, the dead leader running. I want to pray for you in closing because you are some of the most important people in the world. You are the ones that God has chosen to use to dispense his glorious gospel. And you are more important than you'll ever know. And if the devil can tear you down, then he stops the proclamation of the gospel. We can't let that happen. You're too critical. You're too important to the kingdom of God. When the Olympics was being held in Atlanta, Georgia, they did a 119-day run with a torch from Los Angeles. And they would carry that torch all the way to light the games and start it in Atlanta, Georgia. That was reminiscent of the Athenian games long ago when a game would start in Athens and someone would run over to Corinth and start that with the same flame now. They would run to Olympus or run to Philippi or whatever. And, and then the Olympic games, plural, would begin with the same flame. Now just think about it this way. What if the guy gets the flame from Athens and he has to run, let's say, to Corinth and, and that was the beginning of the marathon kind of runs and races because that's how they would do it. And, and let's say he's getting the, the, the torch lit and he's thinking, you know, last year I did this in four hours. This year I'm going to do it in three and a half. I'm going to do it in three and a half. Okay, it's lit. Go. Whew. He's running. Ha, ha, ha. And then halfway, a gust of wind comes. Whew. Whoa. Where'd it go? Dude, I'm making good time, though. I'm making good time. <gasps> and so he gets all the way, <gasps> three and a half hours, I'm here. And the people are all waiting around for the games to start. You know, they're all in their bib bibbities or whatever. I don't know how they do it. And they're all waiting there. And he comes in with this extinguished wick. And the elders are saying, oh, where's the flame? I don't know, but man, I made good time. <laughs> I made good time. No, 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 no. You see... The goal is not to get, your, your, get you here in breakneck speed. It's, it's for you to protect the flame. You know what he's going to have to do? 
He's got to run all the way back and light that torch because the goal isn't to get there before anybody else faster and brighter. It's to make sure that he runs in such a way that he what? Protects the flame. Some of you are running. And you're running with an extinguished wick. But you're running fast. But it's not going to help. He said, well, how do we reignite that torch? Because that soul that was once me is not there. I'm still running. My heart's not there. What do I do? You've got to reignite that flame. Where do you do that? That's why God says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden. How often, he says, for we have not a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but in all cases have been tempted just as we get without sin. Therefore, we can draw near with confidence to the throne of grace. Some of you today at the end of this session, you just need to draw near to the throne of grace. Because I really sense God wanting to reignite your flame. Because you've been running with an extinguished, extinguished wick for too long. And God is here. In just a moment, I'm going to have Bill come up and, and I'm going to ask you to stand because I want to pray for you that this will become, as it were, a location where the throne of God is, that his presence would flood you afresh and reignite your hearts. Game? Good. Let's stand together. Put your books aside and just put your hand over your heart, would you? Put your hand over your heart. This is a holy moment. I want you to let the Lord just enter this place right now. And I want you to let him begin to reignite your heart. He's here. You've been running. You've been running hard. You've been running with zeal. You've been doing well. But I have this against you, says the Lord. You've left that love, that first love. I want to reignite you, says the Lord. And he's going to do that right now. Put your hand over your heart. Lord Jesus, we gather here before you and we stand in your presence. And we ask that you would reignite our hearts, reignite the flame of our heart. Oh God, I pray that you will reestablish your ministry in us. Give us new set points and parameters so that we might be men and women with a greater sense of God power within us, a greater capacity not to violate but to be wiser so that our latter years will even be greater than the former. Reignite the torch. Reignite your flame in our hearts. While you're still standing, a couple months ago, Greg wrote a song that was very liberating to me. And I want him to sing it to you as our closing prayer of this session. Many of us are just ashamed to admit that we've run too fast. You know, it's a lot about shame. We just feel, oh, we screwed up. I wasn't in balance. I didn't keep this straight. I didn't keep that, you know. So we beat ourselves up as opposed to open ourselves up to the work of God. So just listen to this while you're standing and it'll be our prayer. Greg. Dreams that keep you up at night 
toss and turn you He knows the things you worry about He knows the things you wish you could stop He knows the ugly words you say But you don't understand He knows the things you wonder about He knows the million questions He knows the hunger and the burning curiosity He knows the victories you won He knows all you've loved and lost And what it is that rips you up inside The things that make you cry He knows the truth you wish you knew He knows the good you wish you'd done He knows the things you wish you'd never seen or thought about He knows the private agony He knows the secrets you can't hide He knows the ones you wish you'd never hurt The hearts you've broken He knows As you're moving closer to Him Sometimes you just want to run He knows you want to tell Him Things you've never told anyone He knows that you want to fall down on your knees He knows you want to beg Him please He knows you need just one more chance He knows all that and more He knows Oh Never walks away. It's all I want to say. Father in heaven, there are no secrets. And we are grateful for your knowledge of us. And even more grateful for your unconditional acceptance and love toward us. Not only do you know, but you understand, and you still love. And I pray for pastors and leaders and business directors, volunteers, staff, all over the world right now. So much hangs in the balance in moments like these. I pray that we would do what your spirit is prompting us to do, to stop the insanity that your spirit has been whispering for us to stop for a long, long time. I pray that we would obey the whispers of the spirit who's been telling us to sit down and to form a new plan and to do life differently, to do our days differently, to do our, our weeks differently so we can protect the flame of the Spirit of God at work in our lives so that we can work from rest and not from exhaustion, so we can bring the best to the party and the best to our families and not the remnants. So God, I pray that people would have the inner courage and the sense of freedom in your acceptance and with your power to do what needs to be done so we can run with life, run with sustenance, run with vitality all the way to the finish line. And everyone agreed with this prayer and said, Amen. Amen.